It all begins for us at birth. Like little Miles here, we are thrust from the womb onto the carousel of life, carried away in a blur of activities from childhood to adulthood and then to old age. Each of us have our dreams, our relationships, and we go to school, we work and play day after day, week after week, and year after year. Life is certainly busy, and yet we tend not to think about the fact of our inevitable death. It's kind of scary. It really doesn't seem to make any sense that we will no longer exist as we know it. Fact is, we will die, and there is no way to avoid it. Like the child being born, we have no choice but to yield ourselves to the unknown. In a sense, these graves are our graves. Like the 70 billion people who have already passed this way through life, we will join their ranks at the rate of 130,000 a day. And in that same day, 400,000 new lives will be born. The cycle of life and death continues at an ever-increasing pace. The fear of death has given rise to a host of speculations about an afterlife. Religions, philosophies, and cults have multiplied over the millennia, all trying to answer our need for comfort about this seemingly absurd fate that awaits each of us. And now science has turned its gaze towards the matter of death. Beginning in the mid-1970s, noted researchers such as Raymond Moody, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Kenneth Ring, Michael Sabom and Melvin Morse have brought the subject of near-death experiences to the popular front. In 1981, and again in 1991, George Gallup Jr. conducted a poll on close brushes with death and was astonished to find out that some 8 to 12 million people in the United States have had a near-death experience. This is a population about the size of New York City. Near-death researchers speculate that the figures may even be higher, since the experiencer is often reluctant to talk about it. We asked Kim Clark Sharp, who is president of Seattle International Association for Near-Death Studies, why the numbers have been growing. Pre-hospital medical care is just getting better all the time. Not only are more people resuscitated by EMTs, firefighters, and paramedics, physicians, nurses, you know, professionals who have better and better technology, um, you know, by the, by the week. But citizens, me, you, the viewers, are also learning CPR, and that's very handy because the sooner CPR starts, you know, the greater the chances for someone's survival. So with more and more ordinary citizens knowing how to resuscitate someone, the numbers of people resuscitated obviously are going to go up, and so will the numbers of people having a near-death experience. Now, in 1981, when George Gallup did that poll, the overwhelming majority of people reported a very pleasant, if not ecstatic, experience. He found that slightly less than 1% reported frightening experiences. What he found recently, I haven't heard, don't know. We interviewed people on the street about their thoughts on the near-death experience and were surprised by the general acceptance and heard accounts like this. She was having her first baby. She, was, um, she ended up bleeding to death. And um, <clears throat> so in the process of all this, she could feel everything that was going on and she was very, very cold. And then all of a sudden she told me that she felt um, she felt very, very warm and very comfortable, and um, she could see them working on her body like she was hovering above. And um, she remembers God saying to her that it wasn't her time yet to leave, and so um, I don't know whether it was her choice or what, but she came back, and I'm the youngest of six kids. So um, I really believe that it is true that there is life after death near-death experiences. Do I think they exist? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I've uh, read extensively on the subject and I used to belong to IONS, which is the International Association of Near-Death um, Studies, where people come and talk about their near-death experiences. So I'm 
very definitely convinced, and I've worked a lot with dying people. Barbara Springer had her near-death experience at the age of 12 when she was losing the struggle for life against scarlet fever. I finally decided to give up and die because I knew I was dying and I, I was too exhausted to keep trying to fight to keep hanging on to life. And so I let myself slip away and I could feel myself going into out of my body and into a space and the next thing I knew I was in a black space at that time I saw no light I was just aware that it was black and it wasn't frightening at all I was not frightened the least bit I felt very comfortable the space was comforting um, cozy and then I noticed ahead of me a bright light it wasn't above me when I came out into the light it turned out it was way above but as I looked at it it just looked ahead of me so I started to move toward the light and I the the way I moved the physics was completely different than it is here on earth it was completely something I'd never felt before and have never felt since it was a, a whole different sensation of motion I, uh, I, you know, obviously wasn't walking or um, skipping or crawling or, or any of those things. I was not floating. I was flowing. I was flowing toward the light. I was accelerating, and yet I didn't, I knew I was accelerating, but then again, I didn't really feel the acceleration. I just knew that I was accelerating toward the light. It was a, um, there again, the physics was different. The, the physics of motion, a time, space, travel, it was completely different in that area, in that tunnel than it, was, than it is here on Earth. I came out into the light, and when I came out into the light, I realized <laughs> that I was in heaven. <laughs> it, it, to me, it was heaven. It was just, it was, this wonderfully welcoming bright light. It was a brighter light than any, any light here on earth. There's nothing here that's that bright. But it didn't hurt my eyes. And I, I looked and I, I could see the white light. I could see yellow light. I could see um, gold. And there was another color I saw, but I didn't have a memory of it until years later. I then became aware of a bright uh, heavenly being. Um, I felt as if I was in the presence of God. This being of light, it, this being had light radiating from him, and he embraced me. And when he embraced me, I could feel the most powerful love. It, it's the greatest love that there is in the universe. There's, there's no greater love. I mean, it's, it was absolutely total, real, great, engulfing love. <laughs> um, I felt the love surrounding me. I felt it flowing through me. And I, there really are no words. I can't find words to explain how I felt, the amount of joy I felt, the, the amount of, of love that I knew I was being given. I felt as if I had come home. I knew this was where I actually belonged, even though I love Earth and I love living here. And life has always been an adventure to me. But that sense when that being, when I met that being, was encountered by that being and was embraced, I knew I had come home. There absolutely, definitely is God in the universe. Um, yeah, to some extent, yeah. But then I don't think about it that much. I mean, yeah, I sort of do. But then I get, I don't know, not really, kind of, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I think the real issue for people uh, surrounding death is 
<clears throat> primarily out of their religious convictions that this negativity comes. And people are so fearful in this culture of death and dying that we do everything that we can to either dress it up, hide it away, or in some way distort it. Because we cannot accept that we are uh, a finite being and that our time here is finite, finite on this earth. I firmly believe that these experiences are not simply some sort of touchy, feely, warm, fuzzy way to die, but that if we really listened up to the message of these experiences, we could cut health care costs in this country by 10 to 15 percent. And that information comes from editorials in the New England Journal of Medicine, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, in which author after author has documented that we spend 10 to 15 percent of our health care dollar in the last few days of life irrationally and unnecessarily not to prolong life study after study has documented that all those hundreds of thousands of dollars of intensive care unit medicine do not prolong life in the dying one minute so why do we do it we do it because that has become our society's method of dealing with death those have become our rituals of dying we have now uh, gone to a technological explanation of death and dying and we've come to expect these as our final last rites. if we could understand that the process of dying is natural and normal and joyous and spiritual we would find these irrational and unnecessary uh, medical interventions uh, uh, they'll just wither away Ann Horn was strangled by her husband who, in a fit of rage, brought her to the point of death. And at that moment, I felt like I was being pulled upwards. And as I began to float upwards, the feeling, I remember thinking, am I hallucinating this? What's going on? Am I going to float through the rafters? How does this work? Where, is, where am I going? And as soon as I remember asking that, all of a sudden, everything went dark. And I was floating, um, being pulled here in my chest, upward, in a very warm, very vast, very dark um, space. It was, a, it was a, a place, like going through sky at night. I mean, there wasn't anything there, and yet it didn't seem visually dark. I could see. There just wasn't anything there. And as I looked up, there was a tunnel, a light, an opening, and it was glowing. And around that opening were many people milling around. And it seemed to be one man kind of taking a turn at being in charge, and I could see that they were talking, and some noticed that I was coming. And there was concern among them. And they talked to this man, and he looked and saw me coming. And the next thing I knew, he floated up next to me. It's like I was coming this way, and he came right here. And we were both floating in this space. And it was so wonderful. It was so loving and calm and peaceful. It was, it was wonderful. And he looked down at me. And he had a clipboard. And he looked like he was in street clothes, like a, a, uh, like a vest sweater and just kind of a regular kind of guy. And I knew him as uncle. And I remember thinking, I don't have an uncle that looks like him. And he looked down at me and he said, you're not supposed to be here. It's, it's not time for you to be here. And I remember looking up at him and saying, but I want to be here. 
And I had no conscious thoughts of where I'd come from or anything. I mean, it wasn't a matter of getting away or in lieu of. It was just, with all my heart, I wanted to be there. I, I wanted to come. I wanted to go home. And I was, I was happy. And he took a pause, and he kind of, you could see him thinking about something and deciding whether to, to say something next. And with that, my memory, um, there was a picture placed in my head of a memory of my original agreement of why I had come to earth to begin with. And it was like I remembered and I went, oh, right, right. We asked people if there was a purpose or reason for life, and what about God? Everybody has their own beliefs in God, and mine is not so much as, you know, picking up the Bible every day and reading every script or every word that there is in the Bible, but I have my own beliefs in the way that I want to lead my life and the way that I want my life to go, and if that's something that's not approved by God, the Almighty up above, then there are signs that are shown that you should know that if you're going down the wrong track, then you should find a way to get back. And I believe that's how God helps me to get back. Paul Carr had a totally unexpected encounter with death. He slipped and fell on a bottle of cooking oil, which rearranged his internal organs. He felt that his near-death experience brought him back on track. They are running around trying to figure out what's wrong with me. I'm laying there on this table, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, and I drop farther and farther, and finally it felt just like I was just sort of folding in on myself. And I just kind of went, whoop, and went way down inside myself, and then suddenly I just wasn't there anymore. And I was spinning, I don't know, sideways somehow through this tunnel. and. First it was very dark, and then it seemed like there was these streaks, I don't know. And <clears throat> I was falling, but I wasn't falling. I was traveling. That, that's maybe more the word. And there was this, this, this big white light at the end of it. And I kind of came out into this. But I don't recall ever seeing anything. You know, um, but there was, there was this one major presence there that started speaking to me in a voice that I recall that I'd heard once before. That's funny, I hadn't heard this voice since I was a child and only heard it once before. And it was in a life-threatening situation. I, I fell off the side of a cliff and I heard it. It said, kick the tree away that I was holding onto. I did that and I landed in a blackberry bush about 70 feet below and never broke a bone. Never heard that voice again. Hadn't thought about that in... 17, 18 years, when suddenly this voice started talking to me. But it's the same voice. And I've always referred to this entity as the greeter. That's the name that came to mind then, and that's the only way I have to describe it today. It doesn't sound very uh, mystical or anything, you know, but that's, that's what it was. It was a greeter. It was my greeter. And there was other entities out there. I could sense them, but I never saw, I never saw squat. I didn't see anything. I just sensed all of this. And when I say speak, it was, I, it was, I'm sure, more of a telepathic thing than it was moving the mouth. You know? But anyway, we had this chat. Uh, I reviewed my life up to that point, and it was kind of like in little bursts, scenes. And the point of it was not to be judgmental. That wasn't it. It was just a kind of a review of what had happened up to this point. And it became clear as a result of that review that a couple of things hadn't happened that were important but that I didn't have to have them happen, at least not in this lifetime. Um, and I could kind of go on around this series of light bends, if I can use that term. I'm not even sure myself what that means. I can see it in my mind's eye right now, but I can't describe it. But it was like if I went around enough of those bends, I couldn't come back. And that was okay. And it was really peaceful and it was really calm, and it was real serene, and it felt real warm and real comfortable, and I didn't hurt, and I didn't have any problems, 
And right at that point in my life, that was a pretty terrific thing. I mean, it would be in anybody's at any time. But, you know, here I got the choice of being there and nice and peaceful and calm and everything, or coming back to an existence where I'm getting divorced, getting sued, I owe all kinds of money. I got a couple of kids at least to raise that, and one of them has uh, some special problems to boot, and I'm not walking, you know. That's, you, it. That's their opinion. I have nothing to say on that. I'll take the Fifth Amendment. Ask the President of the United States. He, he knows all about it. <laughs> well, I know that when you get a near-death experience that you're getting a lot of endorphins released into your body and that it, your body is uh, systematically gives you this incredible feeling that many people experience as something holy. And I think it's a built-in biological trigger. And I think that it's um, a nice thing humans have as part of the dying process, but I don't know if it is a larger um, metaphysical reality to it. So. And we found that people who had near-death experiences as children, even if they themselves did not believe they'd had a near-death experience, we found that these people were transformed. They were transformed in physical ways, and they're transformed in psychological ways. They are unusually psychologically healthy, they give more money to charity, they exercise more, they eat more fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's not just that their spiritual beliefs are different than the ordinary population, but their actual habits are different. In addition, we found that they claim 25% of the time that they cannot wear wristwatches. And we speculate that this mystical light has in fact touched their body and has altered the subtle electromagnetic forces that surround their body. And um, we're on very safe and solid scientific ground in making that speculation. Although transformed by their experience, all near-death experiencers go through an adjustment period, sometimes very bewildering and painful. I felt serenity for the first time in my life. I was 18. Um, absolute, complete serenity, calmness, loveliness. There wasn't any vision. There wasn't any sound. There wasn't, it, the loud sound had gone away with the light. There was nothing but all the answers to everything and I wouldn't have, wouldn't have to worry about anything anymore because I knew all the answers. And then and I still think this is the biggest mistake I ever made. I told myself, I said, that it's not time to leave. I can't go. And after a while, I found out later it was two weeks, I woke up in Swedish General Hospital in Seattle. And the first thing I saw, because the nurse was watching TV, was a 1968 Chicago National Convention. Cops beating the hell out of kids. That was my introduction to the world as it was after my death. It's, it's, it was harder for me to deal with people afterwards, but now I realize that the only person that can ever change me is myself. I cannot change anybody else. The one thing that has helped me is that I no longer feel rejected by anybody. You know, people can say nasty things to me, and all I can think in my mind is, that's your problem, that's not mine. Yeah. So it has changed the way I look at people, the way that I do think at people, but it has made me very humble and weak because it doesn't give me any special power. Because the powers that you do realize that you may have, you cannot and you do not use. I felt like I was here for a reason and that my life would be very special and that I would somehow be protected or it would go smoothly from here on out. But honestly, for the next 20 years, there was a tremendous conflict in me about having this awareness and being with people who walked through this world and had no awareness that we, we have a purpose, that this is um, that somehow being here is a 
gift. And I kept looking for special things to do while I was here. And for about 20 years, nothing I ever tried seemed to work out. And through those years, I began to get more and more quiet, more and more introspective. Um, I learned to take things a lot slower. Um, it has, a lot of people say this, this experience has changed their life and it's so peaceful after that. And for me, all I wanted to do for the next 20 years was go home. And I felt homesick. I really didn't want to be here. Um, even, even knowing what I did, all I wanted in my heart was to go home. My favorite saying, it's not my own, but my favorite saying is, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. You know, we have to pay our bills, buy our groceries, raise our children, clean our toilets, drive our cars, interact with unpleasant people. It's life. You've got to do it. It doesn't matter if you're enlightened or not. It's the rules of the road. We have to obey them. But if you know you can walk through that wall, it's just very frustrating not being able to all the time. You know, if you know that this reality is a molecular connection, which isn't as real as other dimensions in which one has visited, it is hard to come back. And that's another part of the transformation. You know, people talk about even less than my watch won't work. And that is the adjustment process. Oh, it's painful. This part's really hard. You know, as many times as I tell this, I keep thinking I'm going to get through this. Anyway, he said to me, um, I said, I want to come home now. And he said, no, you can't. And I said, but I don't want to stay there anymore. I don't like it. And he said, I know that. And um, I said, well, I just want to come home. They are very mean down there. I don't like it. And he said, I grieve for you and what they've done to you. And I grieve for what they do to each other. I grieve deeply. I hurt for you, for all of you. And he said, you have to go back. You have to return. And I said, why? And he said, because you promised me. And I said, but I could do it another time, another place. He said, there is no other time. There is no other place. You must do it this time. You promised. And I said, well, um, you don't understand. And, he, and when I looked in his eyes, I knew he did. And he said, uh, you promised me, child, it would be this time. You must return, but I promise you I'll be back when it's time for you to go. And I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. He said, you'll know. You will know when it is time. You will know what to do. The intellectual and emotional impact of the near-death experience is so profound that it often breaks down previous conceptions of reality, religion, and God. Who had all of the intelligence, all of the life, all of the love you can imagine. That when I told the story first at the Ions Group, you know, a few years ago there at Green Lake, that uh, one of the neat people there said, well, Chuck, that's all very interesting, but what did you learn out of that? And I came out with something that I don't hesitate to repeat a lot and it comes on like life is love is God. And if you try to twist it around or underscore any part of it, you're not making it better. That is the solid core reality in the thing. And death, as you heard me say on one of the other tapes, death itself is a body problem. To me, a structured church is just a structured church. It just means nothing to me. And uh, I have gone to church with with my husband and with people, but it, it doesn't have the meaning that it had before. And 
I, I think I'm deep, more deeply religious than I was, but I don't need that. And I, I, don't, I don't need to, to go to church. And it's, uh, and religion to me, it, the Buddhists, the uh, uh, Mohammedans, all of them, it, it's not, it's not, well, it's how you live your life and how you communicate with, or react with other people that is the important thing in life. It's easy to think about God, and it's easy to have logic about God, and it's easy to theorize about God, and it's easy to worship God, but it is very hard to be with that. And I think we're the people that have been with that. And there are no churches there, not where I was. It wasn't about just one way, and it wasn't about doctrines and books but just about a universal compassion and love for everything, for everyone. Animals, plants, birds, all of it. It's all together. That's the way I perceived it. I believe that near-death research gives us invaluable insight into the functioning of the human mind. It teaches us about our own selves teaches us that too often we dismiss our trivial intuitions and feelings as just nothing. Clinical judgment in my area of medicine, that gut feeling that you ought to do something, you know, that we often, that little voice that we often ignore. I believe that near-death experiences teach me not to ignore that voice. Well, this is another thing that I learned when I was there, um, which is very difficult for me to ever bring up in church, which I have never brought up in church, ever. God loves everyone. And it isn't just Christians that God loves. God loves everyone, no matter what religion, no matter what anything. I mean, obviously, you know, we're all, let's take color, hum, humans with different colors. I mean, obviously, I mean, <laughs> we're God's children. So obviously, we should all be loving each other. And as far as religion is concerned, um, I can't make any decisions about that other than the fact that I know that God loves all of us. And it isn't that he loves just Christians. It's really funny because on one hand, because of what I now feel I know and what I feel I've learned, I think it would be safe to say that I have departed to some respect what traditional Christianity as we normally think of it teaches. On another level I feel like I've come to what traditional Christianity really is and by traditional Christianity I think I mean what what I perceive Christ was talking about and the way that was being acted out in the first and second century as opposed to the way that it's acted out now. I'm not so sure that I'm not a more traditional Christian than I was in the religion I grew up with, which was very straight, well, it was Presbyterian. One of the most devastating thoughts that I have to most people, because they fear this the most, uh, and that is on a religious vein, that they seek God or they seek Christ outside of their body, that they are actually part of that entity, that we, each one of us, are a thought, a fragment of all it is. We are also a fragment of the Creator, however small it would be. In singtillions, septillions, octillions, we are a fragment of the consciousness of all that is. So that we should look within ourselves to evolve and not look always outwards for help like we are incapable. Because the human mind is capable of anything that it wants to aspire to. And that was the last thing that, that I felt it was like, this is for everybody. 
who, who, what your particular preference was on, on, on this or that in terms of your politics, politics or your religion didn't seem to be a big issue at all. Do you love each other? Do you care about each other? Do you help each other? That's, those were the basic things that I came away with. Not, are you, a, are, are, are you from the Lutheran Church and I'm from the Catholic Church and I don't know if I can talk with you. I mean, do we have anything in common here? Yeah. I think, I think one of the things that I've thought about greatly is that one of the things that bothers me so tremendously about the metaphysical movement, in lieu of my experience, and in lieu of what I was shown, which, is a, which I think if there's any message that I can give, it's not about meditating and leaving your body and taking your light being out of this earth. Indeed not. It is about bringing the light into this earth. Stay here. Be an anchor. Let the light come in through you into this world. Don't abandon this world. We need you. We need you here. We need you to be present. And we need you to be open with an open heart. It reminds me in a very silly way of the book called Horton Hears a Who. Everybody must be open to bring this new age in. It is about opening your heart and letting it sing through you. It is coming. And it's a matter of all of us. Just open your heart and let it come in. Don't, don't leave. Don't meditate and, and think this place is a bad place and we're going to get out of here. This is a wonderful place. And it's going to be even more wonderful. You're here to anchor the light so it can come into this dimension and be here. So what are we supposed to make of all of this? What is important? Kim Clark Sharp tells this story. It seems to sum it all up in a very simple way. She's a sweet person. She had a near-death experience. She had a life review. And what did she learn in her life review? Yes, all of her good works were there. But she learned that her moment came not in her good works, but her purest moment, which was that of unconditional love, came when, this wasn't even in her conscious memory, came when she was a, a wee child and was out in some big, dusty, awful, parched field walking along and came across a little yellow flower growing impossibly out of this dry crack in the earth. And she knelt to this flower and cupped the blossom in her hands and gave this flower her pure, unconditional love. And that's what she learned in her life review was it for her. And so from birth through life to death, we must go each of us in our own way. What we make of it is up to us. How are we going to use the time given to us? It seems to be our choice to love and care for each other or to live our own separated lives in pursuit of things which will end in death. If we can be open to learn and love, perhaps death will not frighten us. It may be the greatest gift of all.